Welcome to the Three Haunted Podcast, where we bring you all things horror, supernatural, folklore, mythology, and all things that go bump in the night. Hey, hey, what's up, guys? I'm your co-host, Kevin, K-Daddy from Dirty South, the ATL, Hotlanta, Georgia. I'm a post-production master, filmmaker, and horror nerd. Hey, guys, this is your co-host, Ashley, guerrilla girl filmmaker, lunar goddess, and cinephile. And I'm your co-host, John Thomas, ghost hunter, super smartass, and film lover extraordinaire. Good evening, goals, gals, and all my meta pals. This is your spooky friend, Ashley. Today, we're continuing the conversation on demon possession. We have another special guest joining us in the conversation this episode, and we're very excited to welcome him back to the show. But first, a word from our sponsor. Cinematic, captivating, terrifying, and intense. Trap 2021 will return live May 21st through the 23rd. New categories, new prizes, and still no entry fee. Visit trapfilmfestival.com for more information. And we are back. And like Ashley said, we have a returning special guest, the man with the velvet voice himself, Michael Amade. Welcome. Welcome back, Velvet Voice. Hi, Michael. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me back. I'm I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to support the uh, the podcast here. So the hot topic of the hour is demon possession. We kind of segued before into what we know demon possessions to be based on our exposure, which tends to be pop culture. But there's much more to that than, you know, what we see in movies. And we were hoping you'd help us get some more clarity on the origins of and just different types of demon possession. I can do my best, but I don't know what you've covered before. So (laughs) we talked about demon movies. (laughs) <laughs> oh okay okay Pretty yeah much. and someone's personal experience of a demonic possession during their mission uh their uh, mormon mission so we haven't really discussed much else outside of that interesting um so i guess i could start with that right so being raised a, a catholic boy and everything of course the first thing you become exposed to with the idea is the exorcist which let, let's be honest i mean maybe some of the special effects are a little questionable nowadays right but william friedkin director being brought in he was a, a hyper realist kind of director right and he he brought in priests he tried to but if you um i saw a documentary a few years later where he just was like yeah that whole thing with like the the face and the the you know like that whole thing like we just made that up and it's like <laughs> the thing i find so interesting is he's just he's like we just made that up and yet since the exorcist came out it has become that people who are claiming to be possessed demonically tend to start acting in ways that are influenced by the exorcist interesting <laughs> so power uh of suggestion the power of suggestion um <laughs> Yeah, but that being said, there's there's a lot of other things that I've seen too. So I'm excited to dive into this. But uh, I'll have to go. I'll have to listen to that episode. I like to hear what you have to say. I'm really fascinated with different cultures having a similar concept, like this idea that there's something external to a person that comes in and possesses them, takes over, and evil runs amok. And we see that in so many different cultures. And I'm really fascinated by this idea that that is something people have a base fear of. What do you think is behind that? Because I I think the idea of evil possessing someone to do something they wouldn't normally do, there's a lot to be pulled from that idea. And that was something we did touch on, though, previously. It was just a small thing, but it was this idea that if something, let's say hypothetically, demonic possession were real and something did come in and inhabit your body and you went and did these things that someone may say you weren't typically someone to do, I kind of disagree with that. I think that at a very deep level, if something were to come in and possess you, it would be magnifying what's already present within you. Maybe it's not something you typically display. So maybe I don't go murder the neighborhood cats for everyone to find out. Like I'm not going to Facebook it. 
but maybe harming animals wasn't something that I wasn't completely foreign to doing. Do you know what I mean? I don't quite buy it in terms of if hypothetically demonic possession were real. I feel like people that are susceptible to possession and being possessed, there is a whole lot there in terms of the openness to it, the beckoning of it, the allowing it to take over to an extent, and then its magnification of something you already have internally. So it's kind of like the explanation of, you know, people don't, if someone is drunk, they're not going to do something they wouldn't like that doesn't somehow exist within them. It's just the alcohol is loosens the inhibitions for them to, to do it. Yes. In a, in a way, like not quite on the nose, but kind of yes. there, right? Okay. Yes. But that kind of that similar idea. Yeah. It's like, it would have already had to have been in them to an extent. So Here's an interesting thing, and I'd be interested to hear what everybody has to think about this, but the uh, I think when you really look into the, the concept of demonic possession as it's existed in history, a lot of it is tied to witchcraft and the occult, right? In a, in a huge way. And of course, witchcraft and the occult, yes, there's the tradition of, of witchcraft and all that, like which is the actual thing. And then there's the kind of popularized negative term of, you know, she's a witch or, you know, he's a, he's a <laughs> warlock or whatever. Burn them. And but the thing that's interesting is if you look back, you see the things that like witches are accused of, like around Salem and, you know, uh, stealing children, eating children, whatever, you know, all this were the exact same things that the Romans accused the early Christians of and that the Christians later accused the Jews of and that QAnon <laughs> is accusing the Democrats of. And it's it really, it's, it's, it starts to become, at least at this, this base level, it becomes uh, more apparent over history that it is a discussion of how to demonize the other, the other group. And by by demonizing the other group through some sort of view where you're basically saying all these things that we, that our group holds virtuous, they do the opposite, right? Like that's why the cross is upside down. Everything is backwards. So maybe that's a place to start. What do you think about that? Like what's your, the idea about the demonization of the other, and then we can move into the idea of possession off that. I don't think you're wrong when it comes to demonizing what we don't understand and what we can't completely comprehend. And so the whole idea of the other being evil or wrong or any of those things, I think similar to a lot of the other topics that we've discussed, there are so many layers here of what demon possession is. I think it's really, it's a catch-all. It's an umbrella that's used for so many things. And similar to your point, you know, a lot of it has been used to catch all for the other. Like, well, this is a witch and she's eating babies and all those things. And then... I don't know, but I, I like I said, I, there's layers because I think then we also have the other aspect of like mental health where before we didn't have explanation for things like bipolar disorder and borderline personality and schizophrenia. And again, we have that catch all of, well, they're possessed because they're acting out of their typical nature. There's something else in there, especially when it comes to like schizophrenia, but um, it's not necessarily something external to them. Well, one thing we got to remember too is, you know, the, so, and I hate to be this guy because I feel kind of like the Glenn Beck thing where I go over to the board. And I'm like, this me, this word means this. And <laughs> But if like, if we actually go back to it's the word demon, right? It's based on the Greek word diamond, which is spirit, right? So it's just possession by a spirit is literally what demonic possession means. The word demon actually just means spirit, which is really interesting to, uh, to look into. Of course, we've created our own connotation, but we also got to remember the Jews uh, and, and the, the Christian Christian, you know, the Christian basis of this stuff, like, didn't even believe in hell. They stole that from the Greeks. Like, we stole that from the Greeks and we put together Christianity, right? So there's, there's, it's interesting to see how this, this, these different ideas come together. But I think we remove that from the religious element. We still see examples of this all around cultures. Now, I think you hit a huge point with mental health. Mental health is a massive piece of this, you know, and um, now I'm not even saying that there's no such thing as a supernatural like possession. We'll get to that in a minute. But <laughs> I think a vast, vast majority could be explained with mental health, mm -hmm. Agreed. like crises. Absolutely. And now, have, has anybody experienced something that you thought at one point kind of seemed like it could be on that possessed side, but maybe was more of just a mental health issue? Has anybody ever witnessed something like that in person? 
I think I have witnessed people go through manic episodes and people kind of swing from different what might feel like personalities that I wouldn't necessarily attribute to this feels like a possession. But then I've also experienced the extreme other where it's like, holy cow, I hope to God this is a psychological issue. But (laughs) it's just, it it really, I haven't, I can't say I've experienced one where it feels like it's, you know, a mental health thing, but it's coming across as something else. I would agree with that. Like I've been in situations or around certain people where like I've known them for years and they have like a specific like energy that they carry with them. Like they have a very specific personality. And then there were times where it's like, you know, a shift happens and I almost didn't recognize the person. And it's like, okay, are you you? <laughs> and I'm not saying that it was a position, but it, it just there were times where it just it, the energy in the room just was a full full 180. Right. Well, I've also felt like I've come across people who claim to be in a possessive state or claim that somebody else is in a possessive state, and you can tell that person's just bullshitting. <laughs> like to what end? I don't know whether it's for a pure performance thing or some kind of attention thing. I don't know, but whatever the intention is bullshit. <laughs> you could tell, you could tell when you're being put on and it's just like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can tell cause they're usually copying horror movies. Right? Yeah. Right? yeah. And, there, and, and you can tell they'll like, they'll like test out something. And I've been in this situation many times too. Like <laughs> well, it sounds funny to say many times, but like enough times. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Where you see them like test out something. And when they see that you don't react, they like change track and try something else. <laughs> You're like, mm-hmm. you can feel in a person's energy. Like they're trying not to smile, even if they have like the most menacing our face or whatever stoic like they're trying to give something really just malicious off but you can feel the layer behind it like they're almost laughing and it's like okay come the fuck on (laughs) yeah that reminds me when i was i don't even know i was like probably 14 15 i had a friend best friend in high school Listen to, you know, all the heavy metal stuff. And I wasn't into it back then. And he listened to some of like the death metal, quote unquote, death metal. And I, you know, we were like brothers. I stayed over at his house all summer. We were just chilling. He's like, hey, I have a Ouija board. Do you want to try it? I'm like, fuck, yeah, let's try it. Come on. This guy, he got me good. Um, We're sitting there messing with it. And slowly he starts to act like he's getting possessed. And of course, I blame it all on his music because I don't listen to that stuff back then. None of that's. It's all whatever. And he starts growling and starts coming at me. And like, he did really good at freaking, oh my God. It was like scaring the crap out of me. So he starts clawing at the corner of the wall and just grabs his mom's Bible and actually rips it in half. And I'm just like, oh my God, what do I do? Do I call the cops? Do I, what the frick? I don't know what the hell's going on. Finally, he scared me enough. I kicked him in the balls and he's like, dude, I'm sorry. I was just playing. And I'm like, well, don't ever fucking do that again. That's how, that's exactly how that should be written into the rules of exorcism. Just like, kick him in the ball. Start off, <laughs> kick him in the ball. Yes. <laughs> I, I absolutely love, I think, by the way, kicking someone in the balls answers so many things. It does. And Not I think it's not a possession. So, so like, <laughs> Well, you, you always kind of wonder what would happen if, like, there was an actual demonic possession, and like the priest just haul off and just like rack them in the balls, like just really hard in the middle of it, while yeah. levitating above a bed. Just bam! It's, it's just... <laughs> the power of my foot compels you. How about that? <laughs> I mean, the demon might not have experienced that before. Let's be honest; that might be a whole new sensation. That might be a way to get them out fast. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm just yes. imagining a demon like singing the fuck this shit I'm out. <laughs> yeah, like, I didn't realize this was a thing. I'm gone. See you later. <laughs> you guys go through this? Nope. Don't want to be a part of yeah. it. I could deal like, with the fires of hell. I could do all the other <laughs> stuff, but not getting kicked in the balls. This is why I think I would have made a good exorcist when I was like, because there was a, a track where I was going to, I was trying to, um, I was like made it a career goal to like actually become an exorcist within the Catholic church at one point. And uh, I feel like I would have been good because I totally would have done stuff like put holy water in like squirt guns. Oh yeah! Oh man! Yeah, I totally would have just made fun of. Like, I would have made it completely ridiculous. Holy Um, water, water balloons. There you go. 
Yeah. The one requirement like, would be like a long leather trench coat. <laughs> Right. Instead I actually of, own one already, so you know it's like it's not really that far. You just walk in with your collar, a long leather trench coat, pull out, like flip, you know, the lapels back, and you've got your water guns, your holy water guns, tucked in on each side. Which of course they're still super soakers though, so they just look like yeah. total. It's like you know. exactly, exactly. I have a question. Yeah, would the holy water bottles be holy hand grenades? I, I, you know what? If I think he was, yeah, the the water balloons, yes, totally would be holy hand grenades. Yeah, they actually have water balloons that look like grenades. So then you could totally fill it up with holy water and then actually have the holy hand grenades. Well, you got to just wonder. Like, I feel like so many people are so, and I and I understand one problem with priests is they're just so damn reverent all the time, right? Like, an irreverent approach to exorcism might be exactly what this country needs. <laughs> By the way, I, I think I just had a new script idea, so I'm going to leave that alone. Right? <laughs> I, I think we all had it at that point. <laughs> We're all here. Our brains are cycling through. When yep, you get yeah. creatives together. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all going to hell. Anyway, uh, the, uh, yep. the I, I determined that a long time. Yeah, ago. I, I figured it was by the by the shrugs of everybody. What they're like, yeah, yeah, we already know that. Yeah. It's a big deal. <laughs> so, okay, so there is one moment where I saw someone who I'm I'm very con- convinced was um, it was a mental health emergency, mm-hmm. but I think a lot of people thought we was possessed. I was sitting in a I think I just stopped like grabbing lunch years ago. Maybe I was like twenty twenty one. And I went into a Burger King and I'm sitting down in the dining room there and there's two kids, one about like 12 and one about like 10, maybe sitting at one table. And then about one table away from them was a woman. And as I'm sitting there eating, I realize the woman is a, uh, it's a, a man dressed as presenting as a woman. Um, fair. But the thing that made it strange was that uh, this woman, she took out scissors and started cutting her wig and like grabbed the hair and like put it on the table between her and the kids. And she looks at the 12 year old and was like, would you help me and cut my hair? So the, the girl gets up. She's like, Oh, okay. You know? And I'm like, Hey, and I, I kind of still was like, you, you don't need to do that. You're okay. You're fine. You know, like let's remove the children from this situation, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? And, uh, and then everything was kind of fine. And the, the, the woman was just sitting there and then, Suddenly she stood up and just kind of loudly started going through personality breaks like this, like probably every 10 to 15 seconds, it was a different personality, but it really was like a schizophrenic break, Mm -hmm. right? It wasn't anything else. And then, you know, she ended up running outside and, um, you know, I think they called the police because they were just worried about the mental health emergency. Speaking of which, side note, we really need a response that is not the police for mental health emergencies. Let's just throw that out there. I agree. That's a big deal. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think that's an example where I, I could see people reacting and thinking, oh, this is some weird demonic thing. I don't call that demonic possession. I, I call that something something else, right? Now, I have, I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I have heard directly from a person that I trust who's always told the truth, who was actually the exorcist um, here in Denver, Colorado. Like that was his full-time job for the Archdiocese of Denver, that there was a case in Denver of a four-year-old boy who started speaking in like a male, deep guttural voice and like was saying all this like gibberish and they, um, they went and recorded it and ended up having to send it to a language um, specialist and it was cursing backwards in Aramaic. Oh my gosh. And that this kid actually came in and lifted up his parents' bed with them on it. We're talking a four-year-old kid. Damn. Wow. Okay. So that's a little different. Just a little bit. So how do we talk about that? Because I mean, as much as I want to just say, this is all mental health, because because I think I feel like 98, 99% is probably that or some form of that. But that 1%, what are we talking about? Well, I think some people too want to believe something so badly that they put themselves into a trance-like state. It's actually the more you practice kind of an internal self-focus, the more you can actually place yourself into a hypnotic state or into a suggestive state, 
without even intending to. Music sometimes gives way to that. It is easier to, I guess, be in that trance-like state where you put yourself into it. And it just depending, I guess, on what you're looking for, how badly you want something, it's possible. Very true. Yeah. Um, and I, I think one of the, now with the exception of like that example of the, the four-year-old child I was talking about earlier, one of the common things, and this is directly said by an exorcist to me. So like this is as close to, as you can generally get to a quote expert on the subject, that one of the very like super common criteria for someone to actually become possessed is they're usually obsessed by, really scared of something with the idea of possession. So they might be like obsessively afraid of it all of the time. And lo and behold, look what happens. Hmm. Interesting. Right. And then when you start thinking about how after the exorcist came out and William Friedkin and all of them like made up all of these symptoms and signals, and then it started being reinforced in culture over and over and over again. And now you see people when they're quote possessed acting the way that the William Friedkin <laughs> possessed person acts. The obsession almost can become an addiction. It's hundred percent. And with a lot of addictions, if not all addictions, like if you give into it so much, it can eventually have such negative and horrible effects and and could affect you physically, mentally, and start projecting onto others outside of you. I, I completely agree. I mean, I think one of the things uh, to, to think about is, and I, I think you hit on a great point, there's a lot of neighborhoods in our head, <laughs> right? And some of them are not so good to hang out in. And the uh, and it, it, it is one of those things where like, even if you feel normal and fine, if you start physically carrying yourself around like you're depressed and you're upset all the time, and you you purposefully do that for seven days. By the end of those seven days, you are going to be significantly more depressed and sad than you were before because the internal uh, chemicals and things that you put into your body are actually triggered by physiology as well. So we think about that and then you start thinking you're obsessed with something, something dark. And especially if you're scared, you're going to start shrinking. You're going to start kind of behaving differently. And then your reticular activation system, which is the thing that's telling you what your, tells your brain what to pay attention to from external stimuli, starts finding more more and more examples of why that's relevant to you in the world. So now suddenly the world seems like the scary place where all of these examples of demonic possession are there. And now you're under attack and oh my God, you know. I have a hard time though, because I do think there are energetic entities out there that we can't necessarily see. For sure. We exist with certain range on the spectrum of wavelengths and we can only see and process specific parts of that spectrum. So there may be things out there that we don't see. I think some of us are a little more energy sensitive than others, so we can sometimes feel it like as a receptor. It's a sensation we feel, a vibration we feel, but we still can't necessarily see it. Or some people do see things and they what they see is how their brain processes it. That doesn't necessarily mean that's what it actually is presented as, but that's just how the brain's processing those specific wavelengths. Absolutely. And so for me, I think that's all very much real. And so when we talk about demonic possession, I think to an extent that may be real. There may be things out there that are almost like an energetic parasite that latch on. We conduit it, if that's a thing, if that's a phrase. We become that conduit. We yeah. let it kind of merge in with our energy and carry it. And similar to what you're saying in terms of like the chemicals change and adapt, that would be something that influences our chemical receptors and changes and adapts and maybe magnify some of our own personality traits. Absolutely. Yeah, the part that I struggle with is the religion thing. And I know I've said this before to like Kevin and John, but it's like, how are these, are these demons Catholic? Do they go to mass on Sunday? Like, how is it that a rabbi or a priest or a shaman or anybody can come in and expel that? Because if it's like, well, demons answer to God, it's like, well, okay, maybe, maybe, but what does that mean it doesn't work in like some small village in Africa that's never heard of the Christian God? Or someone who's Jewish in the Bronx, who's not part of that specific dogmatic doctrine. Like, I don't know. That's where I start to struggle with is how do religions own this concept of demonic possession and expelling it? Does that make sense? Yeah. So one thing to, to really classify, if we're talking about especially Catholicism mm -hmm. in this way, 
is that the Catholic Church, on the deepest level, believe that the whole reason that the earth exists and that any of us exist is to be part of the church. Like, that's the belief. The earth is made so the church can exist. Okay. okay. Got a lot of problems with that. Not going <laughs> to get into it. <laughs> but <laughs> the, uh, the way I almost see it is like they believe that there is, they believe their answer is the answer. Of course. Well, if, if Christ is the, if the intervention uh, and this is the whole reason we're here, then, okay, well then calling on Christ, the all powerful son of God that will, you know, that will drive out this spirit. Um, one of the weirdest things was, and I might have mentioned this in the previous podcast, but it was one of the most enlightening things. So if anybody here has had the joy of getting into a theological argument with a rabbi, <laughs> it's uh, it's a maddening and kind of life-changing experience, <laughs> okay? Um, and I ended up getting with one, and I, I said something like, well, you know, God said that he's the only God. And the rabbi stops me and he goes, no. He said, I am the Lord, your God. He never said he was the only God. And I was like, what? Like, <laughs> I dig it. I, I love it. Right. Well, I mean, you know, I think there's so much to that, but I, I think there's, there's the Catholicism thing. I think, I think they do a lot of, so let's, let's face it. The mass is a high magic ritual. Yes. I agree. Okay. They circumambulate around an altar in a certain direction because of the flow of energy. They use incense to clear any spirits that might have gathered around the altar. Oh my God. Come on. It's like the same, like, Setting your circle and sage in it. Yeah. I mean, it, to, to take it one step further and tie it to the demon possession, like the anointing of the sick, the confessionals, like they are channeling the power of Christ, which I'm sorry, having an outside being coming in into you to like be a, basically a vessel, that's possession. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I'll also take this in a creative sense, though, too. Well, recently, you know, so I read a lot of songs. I read a lot of music. And one of the things I eventually got to is I realized that the songs that show up in like five minutes are always so much better than the songs you work on for a long period of time. So I suddenly was like, why don't I just not work on songs for long periods of time and set myself up in a position where I can receive this stuff that just comes through? But the whole goal is, is when it comes through, I stop and like get it on the page where I record it. I have to just do the conduit thing, right? It's like the other day, here's an example. And it felt, and, and this is more about the idea of like channeling, but I think it's the same kind of idea in its own way. So I was recording a demo for this group and I had the sound of like a, just a kick drum from a, from a drum set, right? Was, instead of a metronome, I had this sound going like this through headphones and I'd recorded it. And I had, you know, way too many, like just a perpetual amount of this kick drum going. And I just kind of let it record. And I just sat there for a minute. I have this on recording. So like I can, I can hear it and I'm just kind of like, and there's just this moment of quiet. And then I literally without preconceiving anything else, play an entirely new song new melody, kind of gibberish for words, but three and a half minutes, totally finished, constructed. And then I was like, oh, cool. I guess I just wrote something else. Amazing. You had that metronome going. Well, I had the metronome. Well, I had, so I had, I had the rhythm going. I knew what the key was going to be. Right. But at the same time, like really weird, like that, that's very strange to have that happen. Okay. And, um, and then it would take me to another book, like my last book that I, I published called The Path. I know I wrote this book. I know I sat down and I know this sounds weird, but it's totally true. I don't remember writing it. I literally remember typing and having my head back on my chair and like my eyes almost like closed. Like I was almost sleeping. I didn't do that on purpose, by the way. Like it was only after the fact I was talking to a friend of mine who like, you know, teaches channeling stuff, or whatever. And I'm like, well, that kind of sounds like what you're talking about. I mean, I just kind of thought maybe I was just like, kind of deep in thought and my fingers were just going. But now I remember like, I don't remember writing this book. See, and I do feel like creative flowing, whether it's free writing, free thought, easy form of channeling. Absolutely. Um, what we're channeling, I don't think it's like a demonic thing. No. I do think, now some might counter that, especially depending how dogmatic their religion is. But to me, I do think that there is some kind of creative cosmic energy out there that we can tap into and some of us are a little bit more able to connect into it easier than others i will say though i wonder <laughs> how many of the 
people that experience cases that they report as demonic possession are creative individuals and not creative like storytellers, but like musicians, artists, writers, poets, um, which is a writer, I suppose, but a person who uses a specific side of their brain more so than maybe the typical so one, I don't have an answer for your specific thing, but a really in- an interesting s- statistic is like demonic possession cases are predominantly, and I mean like 85% to 90% women, which is interesting, right? We have creative feminine energy. W- what? Yeah. Well I, right, well, I mean, hey, what does that mean? Like there's, there's a lot of uh, emotional receptivity. There's a lot of, there's more in, um, intuitiveness. Like guys, I don't know what you think, but I've learned that- I will trust the intuition of a woman in a group way faster than I'll trust mine. Absolutely. Right? Like, oh, yeah. like if we're if we're all in a haunted house, I'm gonna ask Ashley what's going on first. Well, you have to get her in there just first. because. <laughs> well, it's also like I learned a long time ago. You trust, uh, like, if a woman's like, I smell gas. Even if you don't, like, pay attention. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. The sense of smell is stronger. Right. It's just it's just different sensibilities. So I think maybe that's part of it. I remember reading a story once of a, uh, so there's this really interesting book. There's this kind of controversial uh, Jesuit priest named Malachi Martin. I don't know if you guys ever heard of him, Uh, but he wrote uh, a book of case studies of demonic possession because he was an exorcist as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the ones was a, which is kind of interesting. He never names who it is, was apparently a very well-known anchor on a national news network um, who became possessed. And I, I, and I don't think he says CNN, but for some reason, I really got the impression it was CNN and who knows. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, what this guy reported was like one day he went walking out to his car and someone was leaning against his car and he saw him and he was like, oh my God, it's my uncle who passed away like two years ago. Like, hey, how are you? Like, what's going on? Like, and for some reason, it wasn't like meshing in his head that it's that there's something off. He knew it was weird, but at the same time, his uncle was, you know, talking to him and uh, was like, Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, you know, everything's fine. I'm just coming to visit you to let you know everything's going to be okay. And like, you know, it's just really positive. And it was just this beautiful encounter. And a few more of those happened. And then, if I remember the story right, like this anchor had a statue of Mary in his house or in his apartment that had painting on it and everything. And so one morning, he, wakes up and he's just doing stuff. He looks over and he's like, statue's gone. This is weird. And he's walking down his hallway and he hears scratching in his closet. So he opens his closet and in the closet is his uncle perched on top of the statue of Mary scratching the paint off of it. And he's like, oh, we don't need this anymore. And the anchor's just like, uh, okay, like Uncle Bob, it's kind of weird, but for and he's not connecting that this is weird. But it started turning out that every time he was having a conversation with his uncle, he'd wake up and it would be somewhere completely different than where he had been when he was having the conversation. So it's very interesting. And I, the reason I bring that up is it's so interesting to hear from the inside perspective of what it might feel like. Like he wasn't even aware that stuff was going on. So I don't know. So in a way like that almost kind of makes it seem like any of us could be having this experience at any point. It, and maybe we don't know it, right? Which that's, that's kind of disconcerting, <laughs> like just a lot. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> when I was younger and, um, uh, half of my family is Catholic, my dad's side, um, they had a statue of the Virgin Mary at the top of the stairs by, they had a mirror. Basically it was a big, long mirror. It was just a wall and they put it right there. I used to have dreams about this damn statue mm-hmm. and like, It was in an empty house. It was dark. It was creepy. And it was me and my mom, which we weren't close when I was younger. We were closer when I was older. But something would always break out of the statue. It was always like this demon type thing would break out of the statue. And and so I was scared of the statue at my grandparents' house because of that. It was just freaky. I don't know. I don't know. And I continued to have that dream for a long time. It's just very strange to me. (laughs) Interesting. I, I used to have a lot of, um, growing up, I had a lot of like fear around like demonic stuff to the point where like I would, you know, how when you're, you're tired and you're laying in your, your bedroom, like your eyes start playing tricks on you. And I would just see like, just really like just dark, like obscene stuff, you know, and it was just, it was pretty intense. And then I went through a period of time where for like, I think it was like two or three months 
every single night in a row, I had the same dream where I was being killed and like over and over. And I was like, is this a premonition or like, what's going on here? Um, but then it stopped. And then the, the, the last night I had another dream where I was in my backyard and there were these snakes in my backyard, like they were all over. And, uh, one of them was a really aggressive kind of cobra, a white cobra that was roaring, would make this like roaring sound. You know, I kept getting like bitten and like it was pretty negative. And I finally was just like, I'm done with this. Like, I remember this in the dream, picking it up and swallowing it whole. I just ate it. Mm. And I've never had another dream or been uh, been concerned about that anymore. Wow. Um, and I, it's strange. And so when I looked into it, de- you know, depending on how much you take stock and what people's descriptions of what, you know, dream analysis, whatever, snakes have a lot to do with wisdom. Right. And especially eating a snake is like a spiritual, like awakening in some sense or like a stepping forward and over something. I think the way I look at the idea personally for me of demonic possession or spiritual possession, which I think that's more how I would resolve to, to call it now. Right. Because I don't necessarily believe that demons are a thing. I think they're spirits, good, bad, whatever. Right. I don't believe that they are anything greater than me. I don't necessarily believe they're supernatural. I think it's all natural. We just haven't described it yet. And I, I just am supremely unafraid of it <laughs> anymore, um, mostly because I'm I'm really conscious of the power of the just slap or the, you know, kicking them in the balls. But I, at the same time, I'm just not afraid of it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I totally believe in it, even when I don't want to believe in it. I have experienced way too many one-on-one interactions with different people that I cannot for the life of me explain. And I know some of them, you know, could probably be categorized as some kind of like schizophrenia, but there's things I just can't explain. Is it schizophrenia or is it schizophrenia is being used to explain things that aren't necessarily, I I don't know how to describe it, but I, I sometimes wonder if schizophrenia is used for people to logic some of these things away. Um, Possibly. I will say, though, that demonic possession is classified as a psychological condition mm-hmm. or mental condition. Um, and it's in the, what is it, the DCIM, or I'm probably screwing up the acronym, but uh, it is actually classified now as its own thing. Mm-hmm. So it means it's not necessarily being lumped into uh, to that. However, I do think that one of the big changes and advancements that has happened is that throughout history, so many things that we call demonic possession can now be explained by schizophrenia. Like if we're in an uneducated town in Jerusalem back at, you know, in 10 BC, well, if someone with schizophrenia is especially if their eye color changes, which can happen in schizophrenia, mm-hmm. especially if their their like physiology changes. Like that movie Split, as dr- over dramatic as it is, and James McAvoy's fucking amazing. Oh, yeah. Um and uh you know like that is yes it's overblown but it's also real right like that's like that is a real thing so if they saw that well how could you explain that other than demonic possession an evil spirit has them i mean their eye color change they're acting crazy like what's what's going i mean how many how many children on the spectrum how many people on the spectrum how many people with like down syndrome how many people with like all of these things were accused of being demonically possessed because of behavioral traits i think it's hard to know you know, I, I know that there's just some really interesting behavioral traits that, that do tend to show up in, in different diseases. So I don't know if like schizophrenia, if there's this this whole other side to it. Maybe some people are ashamed. Maybe Like maybe it's a source of shame. I, I could see that in a way, um, but I don't know. Maybe they aren't even aware that they're splitting and maybe some people are. Yeah, I don't know. All I know is that like there's so many layers that just... Holy moly. Fair. And I think there, there's two other things to this. Um, I also think it has to do with how you respond to things too, right? A house I grew up in, we moved into when I was, I think, 12 years old or something like that. I used to, my bedroom was in the basement and I used to kind of see shadows like pass by the hallway. And I'm like, it's weird. Okay. I would smell smoke, cigarette smoke. And like, nope. Like my father smoked, but he was so like circumspect about it on like the other end of the property. Like there's no way I would have caught anything. And uh, just never knew really what it was. And, but I would, I would occasionally get these feelings. So what I ended up doing was like, instead of like leaning into it and feeling creeped out, I would just kind of be like welcoming. Like, I, I don't know who's here. Um, I hope you're okay. If you need something, like, let me know but this is a friendly space. It's all okay. We're fine. I was like 12 years old, 13 years old, right? 
And uh, I found out, I think, because this house had been abandoned that we'd moved into. We bought it was like a HUD home or something like that. And it turned out the family left after their 14-year-old son had hung himself in the room right next to where my bedroom was, like that I had to walk through. And uh, and it was like after um, after about two or three years of that, you know, there were some moments where things were kind of strange. Like I saw a shadow move across the room and like it passed this lamp and the lamp flickered on and off, which is kind of interesting. But after a few years, it just like dissipated, just went away. And it just never came back. I do feel uh, most hauntings that are true hauntings, so not like carbon monoxide poisoning or something of that realm, but things where something is present and interacting in some way with the environment. Um, I do think it is energy, whether it's a remnant energy, because I do think that sometimes there are echoes of energy that kind of continue to resonate out after someone passes away. We're kind of like little mini, in my opinion, little energy balls, like little stars. So when we supernova out, that energy echoes out. And I do believe our energy carries our trauma, our deeper, more impacting memories. And so when we go, when we know that out, I do think that energy kind of unleashes those traumas and memories and the samskara that we carry within our energy. So when we go, energy not created or destroyed, right? So it goes somewhere. I think it just dissipates out. It just like a star out into the earth, out into the universe, and those that samskara goes with it. And so if you are sensitive to energy, I think that you may pick up those wavelengths, kind of like a radio, right? And so you interpret those radio wavelengths in terms of maybe you see it, maybe you hear it, maybe you feel it. Just depends on what receptor is picking it up and how your body and your brain is interpreting it. I think there's there's a lot to say that, and, and I, I keep going back to that line from Hamlet, and I actually pulled it up, which is the uh, um, there are more things in heaven and earth Horatio than are dreamt of in your philosophy. <laughs> And I, I think that's 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 really really fair, right? Like, there's there's so many things out there that we don't know, we don't ex- you know, we can't explain. And I do think there are some things out there that are hard to interpret. So, yes, and it's it's really interesting too. So anybody who studied hypnosis um, kind of learns that everybody is essentially in your own trance anyway, right? And the trance is just called your personality, <laughs> right? Like that is that is the thing that we're in, right? Now let's rethink our experience every day. <laughs> like, what are we watching on YouTube? What music are we listening to? What images are we looking at? What news are we reading? So demons are not real. <laughs> Corporate America. They're not real. In fact, I brought up a study. Have you ever heard of the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research? This guy named uh, Robert uh, G. John. Uh, is he established a school at Princeton University in 1979 to study parapsychology. So telekinesis, all of that stuff, um, remote viewing, all of this. And he studied up until I think it was like the late 90s. So it was like a 20 year long experiment. And then he did a final speech where he was like, all right, I'm just going to give all of our findings out, just present them. And he came, he listed all these different things that they studied at the end. He's just like, essentially, it's all real. Like we've proven this is real. So, and you can study that a lot more, right? But, um, so look it up. Anybody who's listening to this, Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research, um, or PAIR, and it's, it's worth it. So I have a question about that. Like coming from Princeton, obviously there's a lot of credibility that comes with it. Absolutely. Do you think that means that we're on the uprise of that side of science becoming more accepted into the world and, um, and trying to understand like what's happening from the paranormal side? I believe so. I, th- I think we're, we're starting to at least move that direction, right? Like one of my favorite movies, some people I know love it. This is kind of a divisive movie for some, some people, people love it and other people hate it. Men who stare at goats. You, are you familiar with the movie I'm talking yeah, about? Good movie. Yep. Like some people love it. Some people hate it. I absolutely, I think it's hilarious, but it's based on an actual military like unit and you can actually find their manual. Like it's, it's, it's called the new earth army. And they did use remote viewing, but the interesting thing is remote viewing can be pretty accurate. So one of the, one of the things that they listed in that Princeton study 
was these people trying to find the location of some object that they had secretly sent out from Princeton to be placed somewhere. People knew what the object looked like, and their job was through remote viewing to find it. And they had put it in uh, like a gas station in like Georgia or something like that. So these people came back and they had drawn what like looked like barracks, but like five of them all drew the same somewhat like the shape of barracks. And so they're like, well, normally we just say it's wrong, but since five of you did something that looks similar, like, but it's not the gas station. So like, what's going on? So they did research. They found out that place used to be where barracks were and the barracks were torn down and then the gas station was built. Now that's not totally accurate, but at the same time, like that's even weirder. I do think certain places do have energetic presences and I don't think that it's always there. I think it's like a congregation of and evolution of that energy that kind of radiates out. So maybe that's what they were tapping into. Well, I remember Bruce Springsteen saying something, which is a funny place to quote right now, but <laughs> he talks about the very end that he had gone to his old hometown and he went into his old neighborhood and he found this tree that he had loved, this big old, you know, oak tree and, uh, or he wanted to find it and he got there and he found out it had been, it had been cut down and, uh, he's could see kind of like the clump of earth where it was. And he was just like, you know, he just, it was like, it was something that felt eternal and, and, and it was there before him and he thought it was going to be there long after him. And he liked that about that thing. And then, and it was, it was turning to be nighttime and he just realized when he looked up though, he's like, there's something there that it's like the, the essence of that tree, it had been there so long. There was, it was still there. It was just shot through now with, with the stars and with everything there. It was still there. And that the ghosts of the people in our families, the people around us, our friends, uh, those things that, that we think are eternal, they are eternal. They're around us. They're always there with us. And we need to remember that. And I, I feel like I'm also, and I'm not wanting to take us down this road because it's a whole other discussion, but like, I'm also more and more convinced that like time doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm also more and more convinced that space doesn't necessarily exist. <laughs> and I know I'm getting really out there. But at the same time, like, I think we experience things this way. You know, there's a phrase I've used, which is like, I think we, we think in, in prose, but we feel in poetry. And I feel like we experience life in time and we experience things like we perceive them as in, in space. It doesn't necessarily mean that's, that's really what it is, but that's, that's our perceptions. That's our understanding of the world. And so I think so many things are explainable if we're able to step outside of our paradigm as well. But I mean, I don't know where I'm going with this. I just wonder if science sometimes proves exactly what we're saying, but because it's saying it in a different language, we think that it's disproving what we believe. So with the demons, maybe, yes, there are cases of schizophrenia, but maybe schizophrenia is just science's way of saying a different entity is energetically parasitic within an individual. Absolutely. So I, I don't. It's necessarily, yeah, negating it. I think sometimes when we hear science this, we think, oh, well, then that means not that. But maybe all it's doing is giving a language to something we didn't understand before. And, you know, Ashley, I think you made a really good point, too. Like talking about music, for instance, like there's people who will go learn music theory and then suddenly their understanding of what music theory is has to be the end all of everything they do has to be explained in music theory which is where you get like prog rock and you know all of that mm -hmm. but i think the weird thing is is like music theory is just used to explain what other people have already done like that's just us going backwards and like why did it sound so cool oh this is why right like we've got to remember we got to remember words are just sounds that we make with our mouths to describe something so like when you're talking about schizophrenia yeah i mean it, it really could be something completely different than just this like naturally like psychologically all internally you know created thing it could be a, a more like spiritual issue and i and i think one thing that i've really come to recently is this concept and i just remind myself of this every day like whatever i'm going through like including this podcast right now is is my spiritual practice <laughs> like everything i'm doing is spiritual practice what i think also why not both why not demonic possession be a mental health issue that is stemming from something that we don't maybe necessarily completely understand? Maybe it's not 100% completely like fabricated within a person's brain and chemical reactions. Maybe there's an external influence that's assisting with that. 
like you said, sometimes you're inspired to write a whole book you don't even remember writing or someone else is inspired to do things like you hear people say that where it's like, I don't know why I did that. I just like I just did. I don't know why I went off and did that, but I I, I I just did. And I think we've all felt that at some point, whether we want to admit it or not, where there's something that pulls so strongly at you from within that it's like you can fight those urges because you may in your head think, well, that's not right. Or it may be one of those things where it's just like, oh man, that story is inspiring me because that happens with me. I can only speak in terms of my own language of inspiration but for me it's not music writing so I'm not um, inspired by necessarily like beats but there are sometimes stories that just pop into my head out of nowhere and it's like they are banging at my skull to get mm -hmm. out get out be mm -hmm. written be fleshed out and they just play over and over and over it's the same thing yeah it's the same thing yeah and yeah. so it's just like where'd it come from I don't know <laughs> and if, if we're honest we can't say they came from us we can't and there are some uh, stories there where I can absolutely say there's no way that came from me. I have no frame of res reference or experience in life to have influenced a story like that. But yet there it is. It's vivid and clear and it is demanding to be told. Well, like I was thinking about J.K. Rowling writing Harry Potter. <laughs> Let's, let's, let's take this for a moment. Now, first of all, I think that woman's a genius. Like, I mean, what she, that's insane, right? Like no one can try to create that. And I think that's the thing I'm, t I'm getting at. No one could try to create that and be that consistently good. Right. I feel like, and I, and I think I've heard her say this. I feel like what JK Rowling did was sit down, commit, and just get out of the fucking way. That was coming from somewhere else, you know? And yeah, you could say, okay, yeah, this person created it. And sure. I mean, fair enough. And by the way, I don't want to, especially from an arts perspective, I don't want to like displace the idea of creation from the person who put it into the world. You know, Star Wars came from somewhere else. And I'm, I'm really convinced the ones that the things that really hit the zeitgeist, like those were coming for a long time and they probably come to a few people. You probably come to multiple people. I feel like to your point, it's not just one person being given this avenue. Is there like a wavelength out there that people pick up on? I don't know. But we see that happen a lot where there's a common thread. The reason I practice playing music, the reason I practice writing, the reason I study writing, the reason I study all the things I do is so when those moments come, I'm able to be fluent enough in that art form to completely show up for it. Yes. I love that so much. This is a really great time. Did any of you have anything else to add before we wrap it up? When dealing with somebody who's possessed, remember, kick them in the balls. Always kick them in the balls. Always kick them in the balls. Other than that, no, I have nothing. If possession cases are 80 to 90% female, then you've only got a 10% encounter experience where that's going to be effective. <laughs> the holy bitch slap. The holy bitch slap. There you go. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> that's my take on it. <laughs> Just physical violence is the response. <laughs> they get hurt. Hey, they're going to come after you. You got to hurt them first. So <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Well, Michael, thank you so much for yes. coming on to another episode of ours. As usual, we enjoy having you on the show. Yes, thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much. Mr. Velvet Voice, would you like to shout out any projects or anything? Sure. Well, uh, so I have officially ended an eight-year run with a show called World Poetry Open Mic um, as of December 18th, 2020. Uh, which is now transitioned into a magazine called World Poetry Magazine. But now my main focus is in this new podcast, fictional podcast company we've launched called Creature and Ghost. And it's just going to be, it's basically just a story company. And we're working with Podcast First. I'm really excited to start getting things out to people. So Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Of course. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Bring us home, Kevin. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of 300 Podcasts. I'm your co-host, Kevin K. Daddy. I'm John Thomas. I'm Ashley Lunar Goddess. And if you have any questions, comments, suggestions for future episodes, please email us at 300podcasts at gmail.com. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to follow us on social media. And remember to hit that follow button. You never know what's going to happen next.
Are you looking for more awesome podcasts? Head on over to withoutyourhead.com for access to the Without Your Head podcast network, where you'll find a variety of podcasts sure to keep you entertained and coming back for more.